My name is Matthew Griffin. Um, a lot of people call me a futurist, but actually I do two things. So on the one hand, I'm a futurist. I look up to 50 years out. So if you're an organization, a multinational, whatever it happens to be, typically you're probably more interested in what's going to happen in the next really quarter, let's face it, let alone anything else. But if we, if we sort of really sort of start stretching ourselves out, maybe five years, 10 years. When we start getting beyond 10 years, most multinationals sort of start cringing, sort of bit, no, you know, I'm going to be retired by then, or fired, retired or fired, one of the two. Um, once you start going 20 to 50 years out, though, basically, typically, we're in the domain of governments. Um, so governments want to understand what the next 20 to 50 years look like, simply because we're talking about future of jobs, education, skills, energy, infrastructure, transportation, and everything else. So I cover the first 20 years, but I also do 20 to 50 years out. And I'm a strategic advisor for a whole variety of different organizations. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the future of creativity and content, which I think is fairly relevant to you guys, right? but we're going to be talking about the next 20 years. Some of the things that I'm going to show you are already here, so it's a little bit of a show and tell. Um, and some of the organizations that I work with in this space, for example, I see Sky, I work with Netflix, also work with Disney. So for example, with Disney, increasingly we start getting to the point where we have an artificial intelligence that we can simply tell, create a Marvel blockbuster movie for us, push a big green button and off we go. We already have the technologies to do that kind of thing in place. But it's not one technology that you need to do that. It's about 30 different AI disciplines and everything else. So we'll go through some of these. If you have any of these sort of smartphones, basically from Huawei or Samsung, I work with those organizations. So with Huawei, Huawei, we look 50 years out. Samsung, we also look 50 years out. So if you go and have a quick search for Samsung's life in 2069 report, Samsung, for example, is very interested in the next sort of 50 years. And we sort of keep going and going. But if you want to have a look at some of the technologies that I'm going to be talking about, um, simply because there are so many to talk about, but I can't cover it in this presentation, you can go to the website, you can download this codex. And this particular codex details over 180 exponential technologies that will change every single corner of your lives, your businesses, your industries, and your countries. So within a sort of space of about two minutes, you can read up very quickly about what these technologies are, why you should care, how they can disrupt you, how they could benefit you, the opportunities they present, and all that sort of stuff. So um, this will make sense in a little bit. Now, for me, we sort of bring things back to today. If I ask you the question, how many of you feel that today is moving faster than it did, say, 10 years ago. Hands up. That's, I'd say that's a majority, right? In the, in the interest of fairness, how many of you think today is moving slower than it did 10 years ago or even last year? No hands up. Okay, I think that sort of says it all. So to summarize it, if we step back to the 1980s and 1990s and I asked you all, what do you think that you'll be able to do with technology tomorrow that you can't do today, you might look at computer chips or networking or storage or whatever it happens to be. But Moore's Law will look at computer chips. You might say, well, computer chips tomorrow are going to be more powerful and I'm going to be able to buy more powerful computer chips at a lower price than I do today. And so as a consequence, I could probably ingest more information, analyze more information, and with that, I could do X, Y, and Z. Fairly straightforward, right? The problem that we have today is when I ask you the same question, what do you think you can do with technology tomorrow, either at an individual level, an industry level, or a government level that you can't do this year? All of a sudden, I'm not really talking about one technology. We have multiple technologies coming through. So I ask you, for example, from a content perspective, 5G basically is going to unlock a huge amount of opportunity in the content space. So what are you doing with 5G? Do you have a point of view? Have you cloudified your businesses? Have you digitized your businesses? And you'll sort of tell me yes, and you're going through different transformation programs and strategies. Are you using artificial intelligence 
while you're doing that, basically, have you explored blockchain? Have you explored robotics, augmented reality, virtual reality, whatever it happens to be? And at this point, when I start saying, OK, if you have a point of view on how these different technologies can come together to start transforming your individual business, by the time you start adopting them, they've already evolved. And they're on to the next thing. Take artificial intelligence as an extreme example, basically, of technologies that are moving very, very fast. So if we're already moving quickly today, Tomorrow, we're going to be moving even faster. However, there aren't just those kind of eight technologies that I threw up. There's over 400. This stuff's in the codex. So what we have here is we have a starburst. There are 180 exponential technologies represented on this starburst. Each individual exponential technology has the ability to transform either one industry or everything. So for example, artificial intelligence is a technology that can transform every industry, has multiple use cases and applications, and that we can innovate lots of things on top of it. But that's just one dot on here. So the dots that we have on this starburst represent the maturity dates for those particular technologies, when you'll be able to buy them at a commercially sensible price and start using them to do whatever it is you want to do. Innovate on top of. But all of these different technologies are put into different categories. So if you want to build your next generation product or service, you manufacture it, you need compute, you need connectivity, you need energy, you need intelligence, so for example, artificial intelligence, you need materials, security, sensors, typically, if we talk about smartphones and everything else, and then, of course, you need the user interface. So who wants to play a little bit of futurist trivia? Hands up. See, OK. Right, so what we're going to do, every, as I said, every single one of these technologies has got the opportunity to either transform one industry or every industry. So I'm going to prove it to you. But don't think individual technologies. Think combinations. So pick a number between 1 and 10. Who's going to pick a number? 7, Seven OK. Do you know what? You picked basically one of the most interesting technologies. So the gentleman picked bioreactors. How many of you know what a bioreactor is? Yeah. How many of you care? No, see, this is it. So what I have is I have a technology here called a bioreactor. And it's one of the most transformative and powerful technologies you could have probably picked. Bioreactors, just that one technology. So if you fast forward to the year 2050, the United Nations tells us that we will have 11 billion people on the planet. The United Nations also tells us that we will have wars over famine, hunger, water shortages, and all sorts of things. If you take the stem cells from an animal, pick your favorite animal. It could be anything basically from a cow, a duck, a chicken, could be a panda if you really want to go weird. Take your, stem, take your stem cell, basically, from your favorite animal, put it into a bioreactor, and you can grow beef, fillet steak, chicken, duck, turkey, salmon, tuna, all sorts of things. And you can do it at an increasingly cheap price. Bioreactors solve global famine. So congratulations. So we won't all starve, basically, in the year 2050. It's, called, it's a phenomenon called clean meat. You might have heard of it through sort of lab-grown meat. So it's not fake meat. It's not plant meat. It's real meat. If you think about the process of growing meat and tissue, basically, that happens normally within a cow, for example. Bioreactors just do it outside of a cow. You combine it with a vertical farm, as we are in Abu Dhabi, and all of a sudden, I can be in the middle of the desert feeding you fillet steak from a company called Aleph Farms, and I can be feeding you lettuce in the middle of the desert. I don't need cows or animals or livestock any longer. That one technology also gives us a pathway to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. 
one technology. Uh, who wants to pick another one? Should we do computing systems? Pick a number between 1 and 20. Four. OK, what have we got? Four. Distributed computing, fog computing. So increasingly, we are pushing intelligence to the edge, basically, of all the different networks. If you think about your mobile phones, for example, when you have a look at the future of computer chips, we have artificial and deep learning computer chips coming in. Uh, again, basically, that fundamentally changes how you create content, consume content. So from your particular industry's perspective, distributed computing and the computer chips that go along with it will allow you to do all sorts of things that I'll show you. Connectivity. Pick a number between 1 and 11. 9. Pseudo-satellites. Okay, so pseudo-satellites help us connect the other 3.5 billion people on the planet. There's two ways you can do that. You can also do it with low Earth orbit satellites, basically like SpaceX. Uh, we're currently launching 12,000 of those at the moment. But again, if you think about this, especially from, your, from a content perspective, pseudo-satellites and low Earth orbit satellites will connect up the other 3.5 billion people on the planet. That doubles your global total addressable market. And we sort of go round and everything else. You've got intelligence. I'm going to be talking about creative machines. But we've got diffractive neural networks. Does anyone know what a diffractive neural network is? If you are going to program an artificial intelligence or machine learning, typically it's binary. A diffractive neural network, and we've done this over at Caltech, is an artificial intelligence that you print. You can look that one up. Um, similarly, basically, we also have DNA neural networks, because if we talk about the future of artificial intelligence, we've also created complex neural networks out of DNA. Complex neural networks, not just itsy-bitsy little ones, things that do real stuff. And we sort of go round and round and round. Uh, you could have also had things like molecular assemblers. Basically, those came through earlier this year. You could have had DNA computing, biological computing. Basically, where in China, we're turning bacteria into computing devices and all sorts of things. So this starburst goes from today to the date 2060. But as you can see, all of these can transform everything. When you start combining all of these powerful technologies, though, you upend everything. So we'll start getting into it. How many of you believe in magic? So I'm doing a little bit of a deeper future now, but how many of you believe in magic? No. You would all make rubbish family magicians. I say, I'm not hiring you for my kids' parties. So we typically think of any sufficiently advanced technology as just being magic, right? But when you walked into the room, how many of you looked at the artificial suns in the sky? 200 years ago, if you'd walked into this room and you'd seen artificial suns, you'd have fallen off your 3D printed chair. However, how many, so we like advertising, so think about brand recognition here, so we're moving into the future. How many of you have seen the holograms in, in sci-fi movies like Blade Runner? Yeah, you know, you've got a 70-foot ballerina, haven't you? Holograms are they a science fiction technology, or are they science fact? Mm, you're not sure, are you? Well, I can tell you they're science fact. Everything that you see in the science fiction movies, I've got videos of. Not necessarily here, but tractor beams, deflector shields, you name it. This is the world's first free, for free form, 3D, free air hologram. There is no augmented reality. There is no glass. There is no magic trick. It's done using femto lasers. And today, this thing is this big. Tomorrow, it's this big. Then it's bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the technology starts maturing, and the costs start coming down. And you eventually go and buy this down your local retailer. This is the Princess Leia hologram, by the way. But this is like the great, great, great granddaddy of the Princess Leia hologram. And there are now two of these. Because when you have a look at exponential technologies and exponential innovations, there's typically one, then we crack how to do something, then there's two, and then there's three, and four, and, four, and everything else, and we see them multiplying. Telepathy. How many of you have played Tetris? Yeah. Do you use a computer screen, or do you, use a, or do you play it on your smartphone screens? How many of you have played telepathic Tetris? No. 
So in 2015, we actually did the first telepathic human-to-human -human communication, where people's, people simply thought something, and it went into the other person's head. So on the one hand, that's freaky enough. However, recently, more recently, we connected three people together using something called a TMS device, and it's just a, a, a sort of a magnetic device you hold next to people's, in it, people's heads. And they managed to play Tetris telepathically with one another. So they just simply thought of what they wanted to do, basically, and the system did it. That particular technology goes to internet scale. Oh, look, see, the signal's gone. There you go. So uh, evidently, current day technology failing us. Now, consider this. At the start of the session, the majority of you agreed that today, basically, we're accelerating. So if you're a business and you have a 10-year plan, I would put it to you that your 10-year plan is a seven-year plan. Your five-year plan is a three-year plan, because we're accelerating. Now, moving on to digital. You've seen these charts before. But as we increasingly create, as we become increasingly an increasingly digital society, digital businesses, as we all become increasingly connected, it took 75 years for the telephone to be adopted. It took 19 days for Pokemon Go to hit 50 million users. Recently, it took Call of Duty seven days to hit 100 million users. So at what point, once you've built your digital product, whatever that product is, at what point do you see a multi-billion dollar business built in a day, built in an hour, built in a couple of minutes? I create my product, if I can hit the right levers, this is where you guys come in, if I can hit the right levers, I can take my little one bedroom startup basically to global scale and to global fame in next to no time. So you think everything is quick today, we are on the cusp of being able to transform entire global industries within a day. In addition to that, the cost of products and services continues to fall. So, uh, giving you an example, if we talk about content creation, I can show you a way by seeing that content creation, the cost of creating content, is going to collapse, and it's going to drive to zero. When we have a look at things like communication, if you want to go and pick up the phone, basically if you want to text WhatsApp, if you want to do a video chat with someone in Australia, that's basically free. There's lots and lots of examples basically of where technology has actually reduced the cost of um, products and services next to next to zero. So I talked about democratizing creativity, right? So let's get into that. How many of you, by the way, are uh, really, really bad artists? Really bad. Horrible. Horribly bad. Yeah, horribly bad? Horribly bad. Excellent, excellent, horribly bad artists. I'll come to you in a moment. So, anything, anywhere. As we digitize everything, if I sort of took you back 10 years ago, sat you in the middle of a field and said, right, I'm going to come back in an hour's time and I want you to tell me what you've done, how productive you've been, See, I'd have come back by saying, you'd have probably done nothing. You'd have probably watched uh, the butterflies or something like that. However, consider this. Now, if you sit in the middle of that field, when I come back in an hour's time, so technology, particularly when we're connected, helps us decentralize everything, aside from democratize everything. You can say, well, um, I phoned my friend in Australia. Uh, I went onto YouTube and I learned all about artificial intelligence. Um, I also downloaded a couple of recipes. Uh, I did my banking, bought some shares. Uh, I went online, bought some clothes and everything else. Also bought a pizza. The pizza got delivered by drone. Um, and then in addition to that, I ended up doing some, uh, I ended up uh, giving my quick, myself a quick healthcare check. So if you think, so when we start talking about democratizing access to primary health care, who's got a smartphone in here? Anyone got a smartphone? Couple of you, yeah, yeah. Um, think about the power of that smartphone. If I put artificial intelligence into that smartphone, 
I can now turn your microphone basically into a device that tests you for PTSD, depression, and dementia. You talk into your smartphone, it will tell you with an 86% accuracy whether or not you have a mental illness. Um, which, as a futurist, basically, I actually always have a mental illness. It just kind of comes with the territory. In addition to that, if you take the camera, so artificial intelligence and the camera in your phone, and you hover your phone over your skin, it can pick up skin cancer. If you look like you're taking a selfie, artificial intelligence combined again with the camera on your phone can tell you whether or not you're getting pancreatic cancer or already have it. You can combine artificial intelligence with the accelerometer in your phone. And if you hold your phone to your chest, then it can tell you whether you have the onset of deadly heart disease. Increasingly, when I say technology, powerful technology has the power to decentralize and democratize access to a whole variety of different industries and products and services, I'm not kidding. If you can democratize access to primary and secondary health care, with a $50 AI and a 200 bucks smartphone, you can do it to anything. So, creative machines. If you sort of step back a couple of years ago, analysts would always tell you that, they tell you one or two things. They tell you that either machines can never ever be creative, or alternatively, they'd tell you that creative machines will arrive in about 2035. But if I asked you to go and innovate something. Say, for example, I said the cups in front of you. I said, I want the cups in front of you to be half the weight, or the chairs that you're sitting on to be half the weight. Iterative innovation. In your mind, you're already going through a process. You're already thinking, I can cut it in half, but that'd be a bit useless. I can change the material. I could change the size. What we can do as data scientists is we can, if we can understand the processes and the tasks that are involved in each of these particular creative steps, we can turn them into an algorithm. We can combine those algorithms together to create an artificial intelligence model. Now we start getting creative machines. So what we have here is we have a new way to design products. This is sort of mainly in the hardware space. So what we have here is we have a robot, basically, from the University of Oslo. It's got sensors in the arms, and we've tasked it with moving from one side of the room to the other as quickly as possible. That's its only task. As it moves from one side of the room to the other, information is being fed from the sensors into a creative machine that understands the goal, create a faster robot. It's running thousands of simulations a minute to come up with robot version number two. And the artificial intelligence is sitting on the computer by, under the desk. So now think about being able to put sensors into any product, a car, a chair, doesn't matter, an aircraft, food, doesn't matter what it is. Once you give these machines access to data, and once they understand what your goal is, they can start simulating and creating products, but you like you wouldn't believe. So this is a 3D printer. So this particular robot is the world's first self-evolving, self-manufacturing robot. It's called evolutionary robotics. And if your children are learning ro about robots today, they're not learning about these and yet these are their future. If you swap the 3D printer for a 4D printer, though, where the 4D is time, what you have is you have a self-evolving robot or self-evolving product that will print itself off and walk off the printer. So today, these creative machines, from a hardware perspective, are in the iterative phase. They can take a piece of hardware, they create a wireframe, something like a drone, and you say to them, create a faster, lighter, more sustainable drone, and they will go off and they will run thousands of simulations a second to come up basically with an optimal drone. Tomorrow they get to primary, then they get to disruptive. But again, because we're combining all these different technologies together, this stuff accelerates. And in terms of who are using these technologies, I'll give you an example. One of the companies that's using these technologies already is Under Armour. If you wanted to produce a, tr a trainer, 
say, last year, Under Armour would end up thinking, right, we need to create a trainer. Who are we creating it for? What's the demographic? We need to create a trainer. From that original idea or that original brief to that trainer getting onto the shelf would take them 18 months. Now, Under Armour have a sneaker called the Architect Sneaker. It's $300. You can buy it online. It was designed by an artificial intelligence in under a day. And it used tree roots as its inspiration because it was a running trainer. Basically, they sort of looked at this trainer and went, why, why have you developed this kind of trainer? It had sort of tree root things. And they actually ended up figuring out that the AI had sort of think, well, what am I going to support? If I'm building a trainer... I'm going to be supporting something that has got a small base and is tall. What else is tall? A tree. So it took tree roots as the concept. So what this thing did is within the space of a day, and it was actually hours, basically it created a brand new trainer for, for Under Armour, and then Under Armour 3D printed it off in the back. The product development time for Under Armour just went from 18 months to two days. And because the trainers are 3D printed, it collapsed their entire global manufacturing process. It collapsed the need, or it eliminated the need for shipping and logistics. It also eliminated, as a retailer, their need to hold inventory. Because you could just go in, have a digital screen, design your trainer, add some colors or whatever it happens to be, and print it off in the back. NASA are now using these technologies to design all of their rockets and interplanetary rovers. This is an interplanetary rover that shouldn't exist. When the, come, one of the companies behind this uh, particular technology went to NASA, NASA said, we're only going to be interested in, <clears throat> excuse me, we're only going to be interested in this technology if you can shave 20% off the weight of our rockets and lunar rovers. And we've already got a team of experts at the Jet Propulsion Lab. We've got people with PhDs who've been focused on this problem for years. And... They said, frankly, because we already have a bunch of experts, we don't think you're going to be able to shave 20% off a rover. Autodesk ended up coming back to um, NASA about two weeks later and said, we think we have something. NASA said, have you shaved 20% off the weight of the rover? And, under, and Autodesk said, no. NASA said, why are you here? And said, because we've shaved 30% off. This is now the standard way that NASA are designing their products. We also have General Motors. General Motors are using these same principles to design future cars. They just cut 50,000 pounds of weight off their current car models by using these technologies. Airbus, if you've flown in an A330 or an A380, it's partially designed by one of these creative machines. So think about, but when you're thinking about things, Think 18-month product development lead time down to two days. You can release products faster and faster and faster. However, that was hardware. You guys basically live more in the software world. We're also starting to use these same concepts for software. So we have self-coding and self-designing artificial intelligences. Uh, on the self-coding side, there is a Microsoft Deep Coder product that you simply talk to, and it will build an application for you. So it'll do five to 100 lines of code at the moment, but it'll go to Stack Overflow, it'll go to GitHub, understand what you want it to build, bring those back, compile it, and say, that's your application. Google have a product called Bayou, which is being invested in by the US Department of Defense for the same purpose, because software development, if, you're, if you want to do software development, trying to hire software developers at the moment basically is tricky. So they're trying to automate that. But um, earlier, we had a load of people put their hands up because you're crappy artists, right? Crappy, crappy artists. In the future, or even today, this is available online, by the way, you don't need to be a fantastic artist. You can be a crappy artist and create good work. current tech. So what we have is if you can draw this on the, on the right, 
it will automatically create the picture on the left. So low resolution today, remember all this stuff gets faster, better, cheaper, this is already free. If you want to be able to design something in the future, you don't need to be a good artist any longer. If you're shutter stock, what does this do to your business model? There is one company that's doing this, and they do it with faces. Yeah, yeah and that's one. So we need technical help with current technology, let alone future technology. But uh, so with that particular type of technology, there's now a company that's actually using that same technology to create hundreds of thousands of simulated faces. So you can go on, you can select your model, basically, and then you just download it. But from Shutterstock's perspective, you've paid no royalty. From the people, basically, who've actually taken the photos, that's it. You don't really need them any longer. Certainly not for faces and models and bits and bobs. Different color, but because it learns oh, the details. Yep, go on then. Yeah, go there. G allows us to create yeah. a smart paint. Try and darken that up a bit with some cloud. Let's try and darken that up a bit with some cloud. Oh, that's wonderful. What if we were to change all that to, to rock? Okay, let's click on rock. I mean, how many of you can draw this? We can replace the mountain. Ex I mean, most let's of you, try really, right? Fish by pulling water down from the top there. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could be an artist? If we could take our ideas and turn them into compelling images? Well, this technology allows us to create a smart paintbrush so that if you wanted to create a new picture, you can just draw the shapes of the objects that you want, and the neural network can then fill in all the details. If we add a water feature, the network is able to add reflections, not because we told it that, but because it learned it. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow, then it knows that the sky also needs to be a different color. I really think this technology is going to be great for architects, designers, people making virtual worlds to train robots and self-driving cars. The input to this model is something we call a segmentation map. It's like a coloring book picture that describes, here's where a tree is, here's where the sky is, here's where the ground is, and it doesn't have any details. And then the neural network is able to fill in all the texture and shadows and the colors based on things that it's learned from a large database of real world images. I would like to see that tree reflecting in that pond. The real advance here is that we're able to synthesize images with a lot more diversity and more fidelity than we were able to in the past. I really think this technology is going to be great for the dreamers of the world. So that's one way that we start democratizing creativity. However, how many of you can't be bothered to pick up a crayon? Just too lazy, admit it. How many of you are really lazy? We're going down here, we're going down for, to the lazy people. Any lazy people? Fantastic, oh you're, oh, you're all very lazy, that's amazing. Well, we actually have other technologies, basically, and so I've got something for you coming up. Now, this is a video to virtual reality engine, which also has no sound. What's going on with, what's going on there? So, how would you like to create a virtual reality world like that? This Record is the first some video. We combine machine learning to VR. and computer graphics to do image generation using deep networks. For training data, we are given some driving sequences of different cities, and then we use another segmentation network to extract the high-level semantics from these uh, sequences. We have the UE4 engine to generate these colorized high-level uh, layouts. Different objects were given different colors. The network converts uh, this representation to images. You want to create a virtual reality game? 
This is the tech. It's already been used I to create made, a uh, my co-author to dance Gangnam Style, <laughs> which uh, I don't think he would do by himself. We find some good dancing videos uh, from another person and then use my model to synthesize the dance move. That was uh, created by machines, it's not me. So it's got dual uses. So we go down the rabbit hole. So I said earlier, basically, how many of you are lazy? Lots of you are lazy. You don't want to pick up a crayon. What about texting? You all text, right? So if you want to create an image in the future, this is from Stanford and Princeton. There is now a second generation of this technology out, and it's better. If you just type, create a video of a man playing golf, we now have general adversarial networks that will go and create miniature videos for you. However, is anyone else really, really lazy? Because you don't, want to, you don't want to pick up a crayon. You don't want to text. Have we got any really, really lazy people? You put your hand up. You can't be that lazy. That's it. See, lazy people wouldn't put your hands up. So you're all very lazy because you didn't put your hand up. Well, what about this? So we did this in 2015. I showed this at the first EpiServer uh, event basically in uh, Utrecht. Um, and since that event, which is about a month, month and a half ago, this has evolved. But now all you really need to do is just think. I'm getting inside your head. So what I have here is I'm using a brain-machine interface combined with your favorite technology, artificial intelligence. And if you are looking at this screen on the left, at that geometric shape, the artificial intelligence is reconstructing the image in, in your brain on the right-hand side. But it's constructing that image from billions of neurons in your head and synapses in your head in real time. Now, at Utrecht, but see, I said that soon you'll be able to start doing this with dynamic images. And if you have children, this is a fun one. So you can actually now start live streaming basically their, uh, their, what they're thinking directly to YouTube. So how are you going to put that on your content platforms, right? Imagine the filtering you'd need. So what we have here is you can think of an image and we can start recreating it. Again, low quality, but three years ago you couldn't do that. Accelerate out three years, that's going to be higher resolution. This is new. So this is since the original Utrecht uh, event. This is from Russia, and I haven't edited the video, but have a look at the bottom right and the top, top right pictures. What we have is we've got somebody with a skull cap on. They're watching, images in, they're watching video in real time. Their brainwaves are being passed through an artificial intelligence encoder, and it's being used to, in real time, almost, dynamically recreate what they're seeing. Now, some of this is junk, but you can see that we're starting to form faces. And if you're thinking it looks rubbish, frankly, it does look rubbish. But think of the science and the technology that we've had to pull together to get to this point. This is mind reading. This is streaming images, live moving images from your brain in near real time with, say, a one or two second delay. So you can see that that's a car dashboard on the top right-hand corner right there, right? You fast forward this technology out three to five years, and that's a lot better. These technologies are accelerating really fast. Fun fact, Huawei basically wanted to put brain reading technology basically into a phone basically in about as soon as possible, really, but it'll be about 10 years. So now what we have is we have a way, basically, where I am democratizing the creation of content. Because now you just have to think about the content that you want to create. And voila. And that goes on. However, at the moment, basically, what I'm doing is I'm putting a lot of different tools basically, into your hands when it comes to creating co new content and new ways to do whatever it is you want to do with. But increasingly, the machines basically, are both the tool and the creator. So, for example, they're already copying people, mimicking people, replacing people, building people. 
So this is duplex, because if you want to build people, you need a voice. But you need a realistic voice that passes uncanny valley. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like. What service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. It's okay, what's the first voice, name? voice, by the way. The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So on the left is a synthetic voice. You can add accents, emotions, and all kinds of things into it. Yeah, how may I hear you? Hi. Um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people? When? Today, um, tonight? next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like upper like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. Now, the problem that we actually had trying to get past Uncanny Valley, basically where you take something as being real when it's actually fake, um, was a lot of the previous models were too perfect. But if you notice, basically within that one, there were ums and ahs and everything else. That's why it sounded like a person. So what we have is we have a way to create synthetic voices. We also have a way, basically, to create high-resolution images, billions, on tap, infinite. This is actually, this is the technology I mentioned earlier. This is a general adversarial network from NVIDIA, basically, which was open sourced. And these are now going on to a, a non-Shutterstock site. So you can download these. In fact, you can go to the site. You just type in the type of face that you want, and it'll go off and create them. So now, are you paying for content? Are you worried about IP, copyrights, image rights, editorial publishing? And it does this for, image, for objects as well. But because it's an artificial intelligence, it's just drawing on compute power in a model, it'll just keep going. The one problem that we have with this technology, which is now starting to be rectified, is controllability. Because maybe you want a church, but you want a church with a sunset, or you want a particular style of church, or whatever it happens to be. So we're now creating something called steerable general adversarial networks that will let you tweak the images, because you want control. You don't just want a random image that's spat out by a neural network. You want to be able to control it because you need a specific piece of content for your editorial. And it'll just keep going. Similarly, though, we have this. So we've moved from faces. This is in the space of about 14 months. We've moved from being able to create convincing, high-resolution, high-definition faces and images to being able to create what we call full-body deep fakes. Just do away with models now. However, the next evolution of this technology, which I haven't seen yet, is you want to take one of those models and you maybe want to put them into an image. You maybe want them set against a shop or a high street or whatever it happens to be. You still need to do that manually. But eventually, all of these different models will combine. So you'll be able to create a full body deep fake, say this one here, and say, put him in front of a shop in a London high street or whatever it happens to be. Now, in terms of writing scripts, though, we have artificial intelligences that can write copy that get 30% better results than human experts. We also have script writers 
This is Lexus's advert, and the script was written by an artificial intelligence, but it was then filmed by a human. So what that artificial intelligence did was they said, Lexus went out and said, we want an artificial intelligence that can write a script that's an award, that will produce, help us produce an award-winning advert. And what that AI did is it went out and again, just like you guys would, it went, what is an award-winning car advert? And it looked at all of the popular ones, you know, the ones that had won awards and went, they all have these things in common, emotion, you know, soundtracks like this and everything else. And that's what it put, that's what it put together. So again, if you understand the creative process, just like I said there, go and create me an award-winning car advert, in your head you're going, if, even if you don't know what it is, you go, I will look at all the other award-winning car adverts, step one. I will then filter them about and try to figure out what makes them all unique and special, step two. That's what data scientists are turning into algos. However, now we start coming a little bit see, into the influencer space. This is a digital human. So we have AIs that can speak. We can produce flat images of faces by seeing high-resolution celebrities. But what about adding motion? So this is a company called Soul Machines, by out of New Zealand. This is a lady called Ava, and she is a digital human. What we do now is we start taking the voice, something like Google du Duplex, or you have DeepMind WaveNet. So you take a voice, a natural sounding voice, and you can tweak it in whatever way you like. She has a, she has a neural network brain She's being used by NatWest in the, U, in the UK to sell mortgages. She's being used by Daimler and Chry or Daimler Chrysler to, in their customer support division. She looks realistic, but she behaves realistically as well. And she can watch you from the other side of the screen, and if you're getting upset or whatever it happens to be, she can figure out your emotions and start tempering her own emotions accordingly to calm you down. But she also, that technology is going to start coming into the online world. This, I don't know if you've heard of this one, this is little Michaela. So if you have children who want to be video bloggers or just bloggers, this is a sort of a, a relatively basic CGI rendering, basically, of a digital person. And then they put her into settings and everything else. She has 1.2 million followers on Instagram and companies like Diesel and Prada have signed her up for millions of pounds to go and advertise their, uh, their wares. So increasingly, all the, when you start taking all these technologies and combining them together, we're now starting encro to encroach by seeing virtual bloggers. But we start giving them life. because we go from static Hi, 2D to dynamic 3D. I work at Victor helping young people learn about renewable energy. Here's what happened machine. when I met some students for the first time. I can help you become an energy expert. So what he's should we a teacher. start with? Geothermal genius. Magma from the Earth's core comes closer to the surface and we end up with volcanoes, hot springs and geysers. But do you know what magma is? Molten rock from the outer core. <laughs> Absolutely right. I thought Will was really like Fantastic. Like he's there looking at us. Like it's like a real human. Here's a quick question for you. What do you think is the windiest city in the world? Wellington. Nice. If the sun is so far away, how long do you think it takes sunlight to reach us? Ten minutes. Correct. You're a solar superstar. I was curious if they liked me. It's different from like talking to Will than talking to like Siri, for example, because like he's there and you can can see him. He was quite human-like even though he's an AI. Then, the human version of me arrived. How's it going? Uh, good. Cool? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. We got some really good reactions out of a few kids. Is that you? Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. A couple of them didn't 
recognize me straight away, but you know it's me, eh? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. true, I can see that now. It's a bit of a shock seeing my digital avatar for the first time. It's like looking in the mirror, I guess. Let's face it, he may look like me, but I'm the one who knows about energy. Yeah, I think Will could be used uh, as an education tool in many areas. We did learn some things that we didn't know. Wellington is the windiest city. I learned that you wouldn't notice if, su if, if the sun went away for 10 minutes. It's not just a blank screen they're staring at answering questions, so they feel like they're actually interacting with an, a human. He was a good teacher. It was great meeting the thinkers of tomorrow because together we can shape our energy future. So everything that you see is imperfect in that video. Those are all the kinks that get worked out, basically things around his mouth and all that kind of stuff. Will has now taught 250,000 children in New Zealand and Australia about renewable energy. And that technology will go online. Little Michaela, basically the static model, basically that you see today, basically she will become dynamic and it's gonna become very quick. If you think deep fake technology, Deep fakes, basically, about three years ago, most deep fakes, basically, in order to create a deep fake, you needed artificial intelligence experts, huge amounts of compute, the whole nine yards. About, what, two months ago, deep fake technology was put into a application, put into an app in China called Zhao for free, and you just scan your face like this, and you could then choose which Leonardo DiCaprio movie you could appear in. And it substituted Leonardo DiCaprio's face for yours. That's it. So we, the, when I talk about the pace of change, this is really quick. It's one of the fastest areas, basically, that I see. But his, we're going to extrapolate this out now. This is a three-minute pop video. I wish I could but look see for the details. Beyond what I can see. <laughs> I wish I could touch beyond what I can touch. I wish I could feel beyond what isn't real I wish I could imagine, imagine, yeah There's more to who we So if I asked you to give that pop star a score out of 10, where zero is rubbish, you hate it, 10 is perfect, how many of you would sit that below five? No? Six? How many of you would give that seven? Hands up. Oh, here you go. Yep. Yeah. Eight? Okay. Nine and above? 
Oh, you're buying it. There you go. The album is available, sir. Um, when I show that off to audiences around the world, the average score that it gets is seven and a half. And I reckon if that was an Amazon rating at seven and a half out of ten, you're probably thinking about buying it. That was composed and compiled by an artificial intelligence called Ampna, who has over half a billion YouTube views and who has now been signed by Sony. There's another one basically called Endel, which has just been signed by Warner Entertainment for 20 albums. So this stuff accelerates, it comes quickly. So if you want to be a pop star in the future, virtual pop stars in the future are already here and they're being signed. However, as we start having a look at other industries, every other industry is being disrupted as well, including transportation. But bearing in mind that we're in Santa's home country, I thought I'd show you the future of Santa's own technology. That's it, because he's, he's kind of got fed up of his sleigh. And um, he's going to be sort of selling this particular technology in about 2024, because he's figuring he needs to commercialize his operation now. Um, and uh, while the elves are busy 3D printing all the gifts and toys, basically, and the artificial intelligences are designing everything, you'll be able to use one of these come 2024. It's already done 70 pre-flight tests. It's quite safe for Santa. He's happy with it. It's going to be helping him get around this year. So coming 2024, Santa will likely be sponsored by SpaceX, obviously. Um, but that's it from me. So I hope you've enjoyed our little jaunt into the future. And uh, you've been a great audience. And enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much.